And we are live. Hi, everybody. Greetings and welcome. This is the uh, for December, the Ask Me Anything on George Hodel. Hey, Ashley. Um, I started doing the Ask Me Anythings a couple of months ago. Uh, first of all, on the Black Dahlia, and then I was getting so many George Hodel questions that I decided to split them off. This is only George Hodel, Steve Hodel questions. Um, nothing about the Black Dahlia except as that case intersects with, with George Hodel. And this, this is Boxy. Boxy is the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Files in the Black Dahlia case. Aren't you, Boxy? Uh -huh. we've, got a, we've got a treat from from boxy today okay um so the black dahlia ask me anything will be the first tuesday in january which will be january 2nd 2024 yes 2024 is coming um and let me say right now the chat is on super slow to inhibit trolls uh any harassment will be reported immediately okay immediately now if you're new, I have been fact checking. I have been fact checking Steve Hodel for 20 years. In fact, I meant to go get my copy of Black Dahlia Avenger OG and um, forgot to get it. Anyway, um, I don't know everything that Steve Hodel says. He says a lot. He's he's been at it for 20 years. I have a working knowledge of of, of his claims. Um, I've observed. And you will, to, you, Steve ha, has a couple of techniques for lying, and he lies all the time. His techniques are distortion, suppression, inflation, distortion, suppression, and fiction. Um, inflation, he blows up something way bigger than what it was. Distortion, he blows it up and distorts it. Hey, Robert. Um, suppression, he doesn't tell you the entire story. He doesn't provide context. And boy, does he do a lot of that. And then fiction, where he makes something up. And then every once in a while, he will respond to something that he wishes people had said rather than what they said. Okay, so we're going to get into the George Hodel transcripts this time. But before before I get into that, I want to uh, a couple of things I want to talk about in the in the world of Steve Hodel. First of all, he's got a new book out, Black Dahlia Avenger Four. Um, it's wild. You can read some of it for free in the if you go to Amazon, you can read a couple of chapters, and I really don't recommend that you read any more than that. Your head will explode. Uh, but it's very, very dark. It is this sort of fantastic um, trial where Steve is the main prosecution witness and all the victims show up. Uh, it is really dark. It's really wild. Um, Steve's got some demons, you know, I mean, Boy, I'll tell you, um, and I don't say this lightly, but Steve could use an intervention at this point. Um, and I'll just I'll just shake my head on that. OK, one of the things I want to talk about is Steve doesn't do all of this alone. He has some enablers. And one of his main enablers is a guy named Luigi Warren, which may not mean anything to you, which is fine if you Google the name Luigi Warren. Uh, you will get a lot of stuff about DNA and scientific discoveries and all that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I don't care about any of that. If you go to, if anybody is still on X, formerly called Twitter, uh, Luigi has a long, uh, he, he, he is a very enthusiastic uh, person on Twitter. And most of what Luigi does is uh, typical Russian propaganda. Okay, how does Russian propaganda work? First of all, in a social media account, what you do with in the Russian social media, if you're propagandist, you have cute cat pictures or cute pictures of some time. He does cat pictures. And that's how you build an audience. Oh, isn't that sweet? Somebody tweets a lot of cute cat pictures. Okay, so he does that. And then it is just very blunt, crude, unsubtle Russian propaganda. A lot of stuff about Ukraine, Zelensky, and of course, American politics, uh, Trump, Obama, 
I, I think he's kind of abandoned Trump, which is sort of interesting, and gone to Ron DeSantis. Anyway, I don't care about any of that. What I care about is Luigi Warren's interest in George Hodel, because it, it is almost fantastic how much work this guy has done to establish George Hodel as this criminal super genius. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, it is, Luigi Warren will go to threads of 100, linking in, in tremendous detail with old newspaper articles and whatnot <clears throat> about George Hodel and some early crime where George Hodel would have been in his early teens. And the idea is George Hodel would just, um, he was this shape-shifting uh, serial killer criminal genius who could uh, just miraculously show up anywhere and commit a murder. Uh, and, and Luigi has spent a ton of time, um, not just on Zodiac, although Luigi is 100% in the George Hodel with Zodiac camp. Yeah, he, he's there. But also uh, there's this killing in the Bay Area and Luigi is, oh yeah, George Hodel was in his teens when he was involved in this many, 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 you know, th threads of like dozens and dozens of tweets. And it's like, good grief. Um, Steve occasionally will, will get, take some of that material. Um, but it's just, anyway, Luigi is one of Steve's main, main enablers. Uh, and it's a mystery to me why, why this guy is so interested in George Hodel. I mean, the Russian propaganda, it's very standard. He's an echo chamber for other Russian propagandists. I mean, it, it's, it's classic, uh, except for the George Hodel stuff, which I don't get, uh, but it's massive. The guy invests a ton of time, very elaborately cutting out newspaper clippings and stuff about George Hodel. Okay. Um, now, if you're new, um, I'm going to talk about the, I'm going to talk about the, the transcripts a little bit and then open it up for questions. I've got some submitted questions. I have to say, I've got some great submitted questions. Uh, people have really sent me some good stuff. So I'm going to alternate between the submitted questions and the live questions. And, um, this is, thank you, Boxy. This is the transcript on the George Hodel bug. You see that? I am not going to go through all of this. You see that? This is boring. It's dull and it's long. I am not going to talk about all of it, but I have sort of laid the groundwork by going through the life of George Hodel, the trial of George Hodel, and all that sort of thing. And last time I talked about the LAPD's guidelines on surveillance. Um, and the, the bottom line is, and it's, it's really common sense. Don't alert your subject, be inconspicuous. Um, and I, I put a link in the, in the, in the description on YouTube where you can go read the LAPD guidelines on stakeouts and surveillance to be inconspicuous. Don't give away your presence. And so what we're going to look at in the George, the George Hodel transcript is, was the invest, was the surveillance compromised in any way? Did they blow, did they blow their cover? And I think we're going to find that they did. Now, I should say that earlier this year, I did a reading, didn't we, Boxy? as not Dr. Alan Campbell. I did a dramatic reading of the transcripts. Yes, I'm not gonna do that this time. I, I've already done that. If you wanna, if you want my dramatic reading of the George Hodel transcripts, that's that's elsewhere. Um, this is gonna be uh, much more routine. And okay, so the question is, was the, was the investigation, was the surveillance compromised? And I'm starting at the very beginning because this is where this is where it begins. And the first couple of pages are the equipment isn't is malfunctioning. The equipment doesn't work right. And I, I should preface all of this by saying, OK, Steve Hodel is shameless in how he manipulates uh, the transcripts. 
at one point, one of the technicians says, I'm having trouble with one of the reels. And Steve Hodell will turn that around and attribute it to his dad saying, I'm in trouble. No, it's a guy saying I'm ha having trouble with the equipment. Steve Hodell will never miss an opportunity to portray his dad as a criminal genius, uh, super villain, uh, prolific serial killer. He will never, ever, ever pass up an opportunity. Okay, so the first page here, that's all setting up the equipment. It doesn't work very well. Can't make out the conversations and that kind of thing. So let's let's move along here. Second page, and this this is in February 1950. And I and I also put the link in the description of the of of the transcriptions if you want to follow them along. Okay. So one of the things George Hodel says, and it's on page four. Okay. What does he say? They're out to get me. So, okay, is the surveillance compromised when your subject says they're out to get me? I think it is. What else does George Hodel say? This is on page five. Telephone men were here. Oh, really? The telephone men were there. George Hodel says they're out to get me. The telephone men were here. Do you think he suspects anything? Do you think he, you know, and Steve will go on and on about what a genius his father was, right? Okay. What else does he say? Again, this is this is page three. Woman asked the man a question unable to understand. He answered, haven't been able to find it yet, must be around here somewhere. Okay. Now, to me, I read that as George Hodel, they're out to get me. Men from the telephone company were here. He's looking for the microphone because haven't been able to find it yet because as as soon as he is looking for the microphone, presumably he finds it and then he starts shooting off his mouth about supposing I killed the black dahlia. Let's see, where is that? Um, yeah, it's right after where he says they're out to get me on page four. He says they're out to get me. And then he says, supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. Okay. My, my contention is, yes, the surveillance was compromised from day one. Um, the gangster squad and the DA's office went in there. They blundered. They screwed it up. Um, George Hodel knew they were out to get him. He knew that the men from the phone company were there. He looked for a microphone. And once he found the microphone, said, yeah. Then he started. It was only after he found the microphone that he started saying all this stuff about the Black Dahlia. Supposedly, I killed the Black The famous quote. But again, Steve doesn't give you the context for that quote. He just says, oh, yeah, he said that without the context. Okay. Okay. Um, I think that's all I'm going to do about the transcripts because I've got a lot of good questions. Um, so let's let's dig into those. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joanna's got one. Why is Steve Hodell continuing all of these allegations when there's no evidence? Boy, that's that's a short question with a long answer. Um, most of the people who have written about the Black Dahlia case, um, they give up. They write their book and they go on and do something else. Not Steve Hodell. Steve wrote Black Dolly Avenger in 2003, and he has been at, been at it, pardon me, ever since, 24-7. Uh, uh, he's still doing it. He, um, and to keep it going, uh, Steve has to find more and more clues, more and more killings. Um, my hunch is that Steve be began the whole thing as a scam. He knew it was a fraud. He knew the photographs that he found allegedly of Elizabeth Short. Word Elizabeth Short. He knew that but he could sell a book. And I think my hunch is that he got more and more hooked on the publicity, the adulation, 
that kind of thing to the point where he's actually talked to because I, I I have no I have absolutely no doubt that Steve Hodel absolutely believes at this point that he has proved his case that he believes for sure that his dad was this maniacal killer. None of it's true, and it, that's really the dark stuff. And that's why I say Steve kind of Steve kind of needs an intervention because he's at the point where he's seeing the name Hodel hidden in paintings and all that kind of stuff. And to me, that's just that's really a a, a rupture with reality. So, um, Joanna, the, the the short answer is I he he needs to keep it going. He's got to he's got to feed the beast, you know. Um, Okay, so let me go to the first of the, and this is, I've got some great uh, submitted questions. So let me go to the first of them uh, from the set. Uh, Steve Hodell's claim about the photo of Elizabeth Short that John St. John allegedly showed to David Lynch. Uh, supposedly George Hodell took the photo. Okay, what is that whole, what is, what is the David Lynch story? Okay, David Lynch got an option on one of the Dahlia books I forget now if it was severed. There was a graphic novel based on based on the Dahlia story at some point. Anyway, David Lynch liked to claim that he had a meeting with John St. John. Who is John St. John? Famous uh, homicide detective of the LAPD, now long dead, that John St. John, St. John showed up with a briefcase and pulled out a picture that you've never seen this. It is a picture of the Black Dahlia crime scene at night. Okay, um, that's already that's BS. But then for Steve to come along and claim that yeah, George took the photo, it's like, no, you, you have something that's not true, and then on top of that, you have something that's absolutely not true. Um, first of all, how can I say that? How can I say that's not true uh, without having been there? Okay, you have to know the you have to know the the mindset of robbery homicide you have to know the mindset of the homicide detectives okay they are not impressed by hollywood they as far as the detectives are concerned uh the hollywood directors and movie stars are the ones who are killing each other and end up in jail they don't care they're not impressed by that if if i if you're a homicide detective and you get a call from a movie director it's like yeah fine um these guys are the elite of the, the RHD is the elite of the elite. They are the top of the top. And um, they, um, they just, they're not impressed by anybody. Uh, second of all, John St. John was a skilled homicide detective. He is not going to whip out a photograph like that of the crime scene. No way. I've, I've dealt with homicide detectives. They don't give away anything. Um, they play their cards very close to the uh, to the vest. They just don't. They don't do. You know. They don't operate like that. Okay. So that's already two strikes. Three. The what it would take technologically in 1947 to take a nighttime photograph, a nighttime exposure of the Black Dahlia crime scene, would be okay. The only way you could do that, given the very slow film speed, and again, th this is an analog camera. It's not a digital camera. Um, no flash, existing light, you would need a, a long, long exposure. Um, and it would be humanly impossible to hold a camera that long to take a picture. You would have to have it on a tripod. So already, you know, you've got a guy hanging with the dead body. Uh, he's going to have a tripod out there and um, take this long exposure Okay, and then somehow the LAPD is going to get it? Absolutely not. That story is entirely ridiculous. Um, the whole thing, no. Um, but that doesn't, you know, being utterly ridiculous is not, <clears throat> that's no obstacle for Steve Hodel at all. Okay, um, let's see, I've got a question over on Instagram, which is, do you think George c killed anyone at all? No, I don't think George Hodel killed anyone at all. No, there's nothing to show that. Um, Steve likes to talk about, Stephen K says, well, based on the evidence that Steve Hodel gave me, I would charge George Hodel on the Black Dahlia and uh, in the Gene French case. Okay, those cases, first of all, are totally different. And K, you know, 
leaving himself an out based on this evidence that Steve Hodel has presented to me. Steve K made the assumption that Steve Hodel wasn't making things up, which he was. Um, okay, uh, so let's see. Um, beyond that, as I said, Steve Steve has Steve has to keep feeding the beast. Uh, Steve has to keep coming up with more and more crimes uh, that his dad did. He now says that his dad killed fifty people in fifty years. Um, there's just no. There's really no indication if you if you go out to do your research separately, um, if you go out to do your investigation separately and fact check Steve without relying on anything he says or anything people who have like echo chambered him, it you can't do any of it. You you cannot back up anything that he says. Uh, what's in boxy is not that George because what Steve says about Boxy is that, yeah, uh, the DA was just about to rush in and arrest George Hodel and he got out of town. That's not it at all. Uh, what happened here is, let me tell you folks, these transcripts, they're boring. They're dull. Five and a half weeks of tedium. And eventually they just, they backed up shop and said, goodbye, we're done. Um, and so, no, I don't think he, I don't think he killed anybody. Okay. Uh, let's see. Did Steve dislike his dad? Brianna, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, to me, George Hodel's biggest crime was not getting custody of Steve and his brothers, uh, when the parents split up because Steve's mom was a drunk, um, and a mess. And George really goofed up by not getting custody of, of the of, of the three of his three boys with Dorothy. And I think to me that's that's the thing that that uh, that, that is his biggest crime. I don't think 99% of what's said about him is definitely in terms of killing. Now he didn't kill anybody. Um, okay, uh, let's go to one of the submitted questions here. Uh, Doug says, was Hodel really the VD czar of L.A.? I tried to spend some time finding info about the L.A. County Public Health Department, found the directors online, wasn't sure where to look. Um, yes, that's, that is kind of true uh, in the sense that George Hodel worked for the health department. Uh, he was a specialist in venereal disease. That was his specialty. It was not surgery. He was not a he was not an accredited surgeon, regardless of what Steve Hodel will tell you. No. And so, yeah, uh, VD was his specialty. We know that he took postgraduate work in venereal disease and STDs. That's what he did. So, yes, that that is true. Um, but he was only with uh, the health department for a short time. It wasn't. Uh, and again, Steve will inflate everything and say, well, um, when George Hodel was arrested, uh, that, uh, the newspaper headlines were head of the County health department. No, George, Hodel, not only was George Hodel never head of the County health department, he wasn't even working for the, the health department when that, when that occurred at the time of his arrest, he had gone into private practice. Steve Hodel won't tell you that. I'll tell you that, but he won't tell you that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you believe McBride told Steve no doubt it was uh, Brianna? Yeah, I'm uh, uh, Officer Merrill McBride might well have told Steve that yeah she saw uh, Elizabeth Short, but what we know um, from 1947 is that Officer McBride made the identification. And, and what I'm talking about is there's there's a newspaper story about a uh, police woman, Merrill McBride, seeing Elizabeth Short in a, in a bar on Main Street. And my dad, th there's a whole long thing about it. Okay. Officer McBride made that identification based on a verbal description of Elizabeth Short. Okay. When Officer McBride was shown the mugshot, the famous iconic mugshot of Elizabeth Short from Santa Barbara, uh, Officer McBride walked it back. She was a lot, she was much less certain, okay? Now, 
Did she still tell Steve Hodel that? Maybe she did. Uh, we can time travel back to 1947 and see what happened at the time, which is a lot more reliable than what somebody remembers decades later, frankly. Uh, that's one thing I've learned about the Black Dahlia case is memories are faulty. People don't remember things correctly. Okay, um, let's see. One of the submitted questions here. Carl. Oh, Carl had a great question. Thank you, Carl. I'm writing with a question about the endless fantasies of Steve Hodell and whether it would be possible for them to contribute to a reassessment of his entire tenure as a detective with the LAPD. I'm from New York. I'm in New York where for the last 10 years or so, there's been a concentrated effort in the various DA's offices uh, to reassess the work of different detectives who are identified as corrupt or inept. Okay. In other words, Steve lies so much about the Black Dahlia case. Did he lie as a detective? Great question. Um, I have been told by people who have, I have never been told this by someone in the LAPD. No, I have not been told that. I have been told by people who have much better connections to the LAPD than I do, that they ought to. They ought to reopen some of those cases. But I will say, Steve Hodell retired from the LAPD in the early 1980s, okay? Any, any guy, any, anybody who was convicted based on his detective work is long gone. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure there's any point in reopening any of those cases. Uh, and again, I have never heard anything from that from anybody within the LAPD, but I've definitely heard that from people who have uh, better connections to the LAPD than I do. Um, so, okay, let's see. Supposedly there were eyewitnesses who testified at the trial that they saw George Hodel touching his daughter Tamar, uh, in a sexual way. Do I think there's any truth to that? Eugene, I went through the trial of George Hodel in an, in an earlier, uh, presentation. I don't want to, I don't want to get into it all again. Um, Tamar, short answer is Tamar, yes, was a pathological liar. Um, she had been a pathological liar from a very early age. She led a very troubled life. Uh, her life was essentially a train wreck. Uh, and in the, in the trial of George Hodel, it, it just very briefly, because again, I did, I did this in a, on, in, in a previous session. Okay. Tamar gets, is an incorrigible teenager. She gets sent down to LA to live with her dad. She doesn't want to be in LA. The dad, George, doesn't want her there. Um, so it is doomed from day one. Okay. Um, Tamar, before she goes down there, tells her half brother, Duncan Hodel, um, uh, I don't want to go down there. I'm going to make up a story that dad molested me. It won't be true, but the cops won't know that. And I'll get him in trouble. Duncan is, I think son number one, uh, of the, of the Hodel clan. Uh, he is Tamar's older half brother. He is Steve Hodel's half brother and significantly, um, uh, Duncan and Steve had a falling out over Black Dolly Avenger. Duncan, you know, when Black Dolly Avenger came out, Duncan never talked to Steve again. Duncan is now dead, by the way, as is Tamar. Um, but it was, it was, it, it was viciously, it was maliciously done. Uh, Tamar's charges were maliciously done, uh, made. Um, she accused George and uh, 13 boys at Hollywood High School, you know. Um, and again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I, I covered it in a previous episode. But um, during the trial of George Hodel, there was uh, the mom got up and testified that Tamar was a, a pathological liar. The grandmother uh, testified that Tamar was a pathological liar. Um, maybe eight other women, all women, all of them women testify that, yeah, tomorrow is a liar. We wouldn't believe her under oath. And remember, let me point this out. The jury in the George Hodel trial was mostly women. It was either uh, eight women and four men or nine women and three men. I mean, it depends on the, on the, on the, uh, on the count. So, um, Tamar failed to convince a jury of mostly women that any of this had happened. Um, so no, it, it's, I just, you know, I generally, you know, as I said, it's, it's just, uh, Tamar was, and again, her, the rest of her life was a train wreck. 
Um, so I just, anything coming from Tamar is really uh, suspect. Okay. Um, okay. Folks on Instagram. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lady Tyler Bio Rodriguez got one of your questions. Okay. You said Steve thinks William Hirons is innocent. Did Steve start that movement? It seems from the late 2000s onward. No, I do not think so. Um, uh, Steve didn't start it. Steve definitely jumped on the bandwagon uh, for very complicated reasons, but he didn't start that. Um, I will say there is, I think everybody probably knows what the Innocence, Pro Innocence Project is. Um, wrongful. It looks at wrongful convictions and that kind of thing. Um, there is there is no doubt in my mind that William Hirons uh, did it. Um, it suits Steve Hodel's purposes to have William Hirons be not guilty and to have his dad do it for the simple reason that the simple reason of theft. What? Yeah. Steve Hodel steals ideas from people. And there was a guy who came up with this crazy, crazy, crazy idea that um, Elizabeth Short's body was left on, um, Elizabeth Short's body was left on uh, Norton Avenue as they po pointed toward uh, Degnan, which is a couple streets over, uh, and an indicator to the, the Degnan case. And um, that, uh, the, and the Suzanne Degnan case occurred a year earlier, 1946. And um, there was a, uh, a street near the house called Hollywood. And so Steve has uh, borrowed that idea. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give the original website, uh, first of all, because it was totally crazy. Now it has been taken over by a, um, just a total crackpot. It, it is malware at this point. So, um, you, you can't really go to that website anymore. Uh, but the guy came up with this total it, it, idea that the Norton Avenue was a pointer to Degnan. And Steve has gotten to the point where he'll say, yeah, Elizabeth Short's body was left on uh, off Degnan, which is, oh, come on. It wasn't. It wasn't anywhere close to Degnan. It was a couple of blocks away. But Steve has got this map thing so burned into his brain that he can't let go of it. Okay, what what's what is Steve Hodell's proof that his dad killed Suzanne Degnan? Okay, well, in in the world of in the world of 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 Steve Hodell, uh, his dad was this shape shifting genius super criminal who could just zip around the world and kill people and commit famous unsolved murders. Uh, he has never laid any groundwork of his dad being in Chicago at the time Suzanne Degnan was, he hadn't, he hasn't done a lick of that. Um, how does he establish it? Well, Steve has this thing called thought prints. Uh, and that is where Steve goes into this trance-like state of, I'm getting a thought print. Uh, and I, he will recognize his dad's handwriting or something, or, and he'll say, oh, well, uh, yeah, it, it, it's definitely my dad based on these thought prints. And it's just, you know, the thing about Steve and his thought prints, it only works for Steve and it only works for Steve on George Hodel. So, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty sketchy. Anyway, um, reading the original newspaper coverage of the Hirons case, yeah, I, I am confident William Hirons did it. William Hirons was smart. Uh, he was a very bright guy. He was a burglar. And they found a ton of stuff that he had stolen. And one of the places that he hit uh, for a bur as a burglary had a view of Suzanne Degnan's bedroom. And that was that was part of the that was part of the link. Uh, Hirons was a hunter. Okay. If you read the news stories carefully, you will see that William Hirons was a hunter. He knew how to dress game. And you will see he did taxidermy. If you, you have to read the news stories very carefully to look for that stuff, but it's there. And I would highly recommend, if you want to know about the Hirons case, read the Chicago Tribune 
uh, news stories about the Hirons case. Um, they're online, and I have to say it's pretty good writing. I, I was not a fan of the I was not a fan of the Chicago Tribune at all, but their crime writing is really some of the best I have read. I've read a lot of newspapers from the 1940s, and the Tribune's coverage of the of crime and of the Hirons case it's it's really top notch. Uh, they did not pull punches in terms of um, police brutality. Uh, when Suzanne Degnan was first killed, uh, they grabbed like I think it was the jan it was a janitor or a cleaning guy who who found the body, and they they really put him through the ringer. Uh, he brought a brutality suit against the Chicago Police Department uh, for for brutality, and rightly so. Uh, that said, uh, I'm I'm confident I, I'm confident uh, Hirons did it. You know I don't care about Wikipedia, <laughs> Wikipedia. Based on my experience with the Black Dahlia and Wikipedia, is utter garbage. Um, I will I will say this: a lot of people and 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 Steve Hodell will kind of get on the bag and bandwagon here and say, "Well, Hirons was never given a trial." Now, Steve is a cop; he knows better than that. He really does. Hirons pleaded guilty, and if you plead guilty, you don't get a trial. That's how the system works. And for Steve to say, "Oh, he didn't get a trial," it's like, of course not. He pled guilty. Give me a break. Um, there is, and and, and I will, I'll say one more thing about the Hirons case, which is this: it is frequently cited that oh, this uh, Hirons brought his conviction up on appeal, and there was a judge who said, well, blah, you know, had some qualms about it. What did the judge say? If you read the entire decision, not just the cherry picked sentence or two. Okay, um, the judge said. The problem was Hirons was not allowed to bring a, an insanity defense. That doesn't mean I don't think he was guilty. Not at all. He just, he should have, if he was going to, if, if he was insane, he should have been allowed to plead uh, innocent by reason of insane, not guilty by reason of insanity. And so that, that is what the judge is really saying. Of course, um, that gets left out uh, by people who cherry pick their facts. But that's but that's the real story. Uh, okay, let's see here. Um, Brianna, after all these years, does Tamar still say your father raped? Uh, Tamar's dead, so you know it's she has gone on to her great reward. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Let's see. Were medical students in the 1930s instructed in the bisection of human beings? There's you know the. Steve has come up. Well, I'm not sure Steve has come up with it because Steve's kind of lazy about his research. But one of his little minions found a story about um, a, a surgical procedure in which people are cut in half. And Steve has run with the gate, run with the ball. And he said, oh, yeah, that was taught in medical school in the 1930s. No, not in the least. No, that is total, total Steve fiction. He wants it to be true. It was not. Um, that That is just... And and Steve is not above totally making things up. That's kind of how he operates. Okay. Um, let's see. Any questions over here? Okay. Uh, John Douglas. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ashley, was the LAPD really corrupt in the '40s? I know Frank Shaw was mayor back then, and apparently he was recalled. Well, Ashley, you've got your you're kind of compressing uh, time together. Um, what you have is the Frank Frank Shaw was the mayor in 1938 and he was recalled and his brother joe uh was also involved and the the there are all kinds of corruption um in within the lapd uh possible potential and what they were doing is selling jobs they were selling jobs and promotions you want to be a cop you bought your job i had a retired lapd captain said you know yeah before world war ii i was looking at going into the LAPD, but in those days you bought your job and I didn't want to do that. And so that was kind of what was going on. It wasn't in terms of like, I, I would say knowing what I do about the history of the LAPD, you didn't buy your way out of a traffic ticket, that kind of thing. No. Um, in terms of payoffs and all that sort of stuff, the kind of bribery you would find in Chicago. Um, no, you don't find that in LA. Um, and let me say, City of my birth, Chicago. I have seen Chicago police officers 
be bribed. I have personally witnessed that. Yeah, for sure that happens in Chicago. No question about it. it there was never that kind of, of, of payoff. Um, what you would find is it kind of is just the opposite with the LAPD. Uh, they would have detectives stationed at the train station uh, and later on at the airport. And if, if some guy got off the train that they didn't want in town, they would put him on the next train out of town. They absolutely did that. They absolutely no question. Now, get out of town. You're not wanted here. Um, and I, I could say a lot more about that, but uh, that'll that'll do for now. Uh, no, uh, Steve Hodel is very invested in uh, the L and he will say, yeah, it was a real LA confidential. And no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, the, the history very briefly is this, um, you had a reform, you had a reform police chief, uh, named Arthur Homan. Uh, he stepped down. You got a guy named CB Horrell who was the world war II police chief. He lost most of the, the, his police officers to the war. They went off to in the, the military. So he had a lot of replacement officers. Um, then all the officers came back from World War II. So there was a huge, there, there was, it was a tumultuous period for the LAPD. And people say, well, what about Brenda Allen? It's like, okay. Now who is Brenda Allen? Bre Brenda Allen was the Hollywood ma madam of the late forties. Okay. Okay. Brenda Allen. What about Brenda Allen? Was Brenda Allen ever suspected of killing anyone? No. Was Brenda Allen investigated by the homicide squad, the homicide bureau? No, she was investigated by homicide cops. And so, yeah, there was Brenda Allen for sure, but zero. And you have to understand how the LAPD is compartmentalized. Uh, it, it's not like these departments talk to each other. Um, and so they brought in, after Horrell stepped down, they brought in a Marine general uh, named William Wharton, and he was police chief for a while. He did an in internal investigation on the department, and he said, yeah, there's a few, we found a few bad apples, but it's generally a pretty clean department. Um, and what, what, one of the LAPD retirees told me a long time ago, and, it, and it's good advice. He said, the question isn't whether you're going to find bad cops. You will. There's always the, there was always human nature to contend with. So the question isn't if you find bad cops. The question is, what do you do when you find them? How do you handle that? And, and so that really was it. Uh, the, the department was pretty clean. It, it really was. And the Black Dolly investigation was um, state of the art for 1947. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Wikipedia is just, okay. Let's see here. Okay, uh, this is kind of a follow-up on the Degnan question. Uh, Steve Hodel likes to cite the Degnan killing as a crime committed by his father, George Hodel, as a means to build him into a serial killer. Whereas you said that the Black Dahlia killing was more likely a one-off, which is extremely interesting to consider since the killing was very shocking and seems like a serial killing would do more. Yeah, I have a lot to say about that. Steve, of course, will say, oh, well, anybody who says... Uh, that it was a one-off is, you know, just, you know, not to be believed. And I, the great detective, have linked my father to all these different killings. Um, because, of course, his dad was the most prolific killer, uh, serial killer who ever lived. You know, I mean, it's wild. Anyway, why do I say, in contradiction to Steve Hodel, that the Black Dahlia killing was one of a kind? And I will tell you this. I started out just like everybody else, had to be a serial killing. The police were just inexperienced at the time. They didn't recognize it as a serial killing, and it had to be that. So I started that, yeah, it had to be a serial killing, and came around after a lot of research, a lot of research, um, to decide that it's one of a kind. There's nothing like it. There really is nothing like it when you, you will... And, and, and I, will, I will make this point repeatedly. Unsolved killings have an incredible magnetism for one another in the public imagination. Uh, they fall into patterns. Uh, and in the public imagination, 
important details that make them different, they all disappear. And so it's like, oh, this is just like this and this is just like that. And, and really they're quite different. Um, the reality is there is absolutely nothing like the Black Dahlia case. I've looked at them. I've looked long and hard. And when you look at all these so-called loan, they don't even come close. There isn't anything um, as vicious uh, it, it is, uh, the thing about Elizabeth Short is you have this controlled savagery uh, where it is, I mean, the attack on her is really savage, and yet it's controlled. It, it, is, it is this bizarre fusion of insanity and, and, and control. It's like controlled insanity. There's just nothing like it. There really isn't. I have looked and looked and looked, and... And I, and I won't belabor the point, I'll just say this. Generally speaking, um, dismemberment is about uh, concealment and disposal. Um, there's a great book out called Last Call, uh, Elon, I think the, the author's name is Elon Green. It's, it's a book that came out in the last year or two. And it's about a surgical nurse who was picking up um, el older gay men at gay bars who were in New York out of town. Uh, that's why it's called Last Call. Um, you know, it's like the bar's getting ready to close up. And and, and the surgical nurse was um, killing these guys in, and dismembering them in his bathtub. And then he would put the body parts in, a, in trash bags and take them out and leave them along turnpikes in New Jersey. Generally, they were left in turn, along turnpikes in New Jersey. Uh, and he eventually got caught because some of the material, there was a... Um, like a cash register receipt in one of the bags. And that's how, that's how they focused in on him. Anyway, um, there, there really is nothing like it. I've looked, I've looked long and hard and it really, there really isn't. And I, again, I started out with the idea that it was a serial killing had to be the cops didn't wreck. Well, it turns out, yeah, the police in the forties were well acquainted with serial killings. They didn't call them serial killing, but they knew about that. Um, okay. Let's see here. Do I think Steve photo proof cigarette burns on Elizabeth? No, Brianna. That is one of the myths about Elizabeth Short that there were cigarette burns. Okay, there were not. There was about the time of the Black Dolly killing. Shortly after that, uh, there was a young woman who ran away from home or ditched school. I forget. I forget the details now. Um, but she claimed that she had been kidnapped and gotten away from her kidnapper. And the kidnapper said something like, I'm going to do to you what I did to the Black Dahlia. There, there was a, a, a bit of that uh, happened. Anyway, she burned herself with a cigarette. Okay. So that's kind of where that story originated. Uh, Elizabeth Short was not burned with a cigarette. No, not. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Spins and needles. I got one of your questions here. Uh, is there a single shred of evidence that George Hodel worked in any way for the Los Angeles police sheriffs or the district attorney? Is there any evidence that he saw police officers with VD in his county health practice? Is there any evidence that police officers or power city, uh, city authorities sent their family members to George Hodel for STD treatment or abortion? Um, is there any possible way that LA authorities were afraid of George Hodel and secrets he may have gathered on them? Uh, people continually say that George Hodel was too powerful to prosecute, though authorities did not prevent his arrest and trial, for instance. That's absolutely true. Uh, was George Hodel being protected by the most powerful people in Los Angeles um, because he knew their secrets? What typically happened to people who were a threat to Los Angeles authorities? Or is the very idea absurd and only made as a lie to fool people? Well, yeah. I mean, the short answer is yes. It's it's The idea is absurd and only made as a lie to fool people. Let me backtrack. Okay, let's take a, a little bit deeper dive on that. Um, Steve Hodell has unearthed a photo that shows his dad making a presentation to the L to LAPD, supposedly LAPD officers at the academy, apparently. That's it. Um, George Hodell only worked for the health department a couple of years. Uh, he quit to go into private practice. Uh, I forget the dates now. It's it's in one of my previous things about how long he was with the health department. It was not all that long. Um, he had a clinic in uh, Bronzeville. 
Okay. What was that? Okay. World War II. What happened during World War II? There was a, a large uh, population of people, people of Japanese ancestry in, guess where? Little Tokyo. Okay. What happened in World War II? The folks who were in Little Tokyo were put in internment camps. Okay. Little Tokyo is unoccupied. Okay. What else happened during World War II? You had all these black people coming to, leaving the South and coming to Los Angeles. Okay. That also happened, the Great Migration. Well, Los Angeles is, for real, a segregated city. And if you're a, a person of color, and not just black, but, you know, but definitely black, but also if you were like East Indian or different ethnicities, um, there were deed covenants and whatnot restrictions that you could only live in, in, you could not live in certain parts of town. And if you tried to live there, you would be prosecuted. Um, that happened in Beverly Hills. So it was a real thing. So Los Angeles has got, hey, guess what? Little Tokyo is vacant because all the people of Japanese ancestry are, are in the internment camps. We have all these black people streaming into Los Angeles. What are we going to do with them? I know. We'll put them in Little Tokyo. So they did. So Little Tokyo was reinvented as um, Bronzeville. And that's where the clinic was. It was not for the rich and powerful elite of the of, of the civic center, uh, the hall, the corridors of power. And I mean, if you look at who was running the show, in, they're all old guys. You know, it's like VD would not have been the first, you know, how you get VD, that wouldn't have been the first thing on their mind anyway. It was a health clinic for people uh, who had come to L.A. Uh, and, and George Hedell's, uh was a, okay. You know what, Gunnar? I'm going to let you stay. Um, and it hasn't been 25 years, but but thank you. Um, Steve Hodell lies. He lies all the time. He lies about everything. Yeah, you can take care of him. Anyway, um, so that was that was George Hodel's clientele. It was not the rich and powerful of L.A. And Steve's claim that his dad knew too much is just ridiculous. Well, you know, it's just no. The whole thing is just goofy. It, it is just Steve Hodel nonsense. OK, let's see here. Um, yeah. OK, let me go up to the top of the submitted questions here. OK. Let's see. Okay. Do I have a copy of this Hollywood independent piece um, that Steve Hodell sent to his father, the one that awarded him the Inspector Clouseau Award? No, I don't know about that. Uh, Steve has this thing on his blog about the Inspector Clouseau Award. And I, you know, again, I have been fact checking Steve Hodell on and off since publication of uh, Black Dolly Avenger in 2003. But I can't claim to know. I mean, you know, the thing about it for Steve, um, it's a full-time obsession. Uh, his dad, proving his dad was was this maniacal killer. Steve doesn't stop. Usually people write their Black Dahlia book and they go on and do something else. Steve has made it his life's work. Uh, okay. Uh, do I think that Fauna's daughters are trying to get a piece of this deception for monetary gain? Oh, yeah. Um, what's? Let me back up and take a running jump at that. Uh, you have the whole Tamar Hodel branch. Tamar is dead. Um, her daughter, she had two, she had a couple of kids. One of the daughters was Fauna Hodel. And Tamar wins Mother of the Year by handing off Fauna to a washroom attendant in Nevada. Okay, that's fauna. That's fauna number one. Fauna is raised by this family. But it's a black family. Fauna Hodel is raised thinking that she's black. That's a great story. I have to say that is absolutely a great story. You have this white woman raised in, by a black family thinking that she is black or mixed, and she isn't. And she finally finds that out. Okay, Fauna Hodel writes a book about that. And then what comes along? Black Dolly Avenger. 
And so Fauna just, oh, that's a good story. We'll just throw in all the Black Dolly Avenger stuff. So Fauna appropriates all of Steve's claims. Now, Fauna had not met Tamar until she was an adult. Uh, Tamar was living in Hawaii. So Fauna goes out to Hawaii, and her comment is, Tamar was hippie, her mother was hippie of the year. Um, so that's that was kind of that. Anyway, you've got Tamar, you've got Fauna, and then you've got Fauna's two daughters, uh, Yvette and Rasha. And if you're not familiar with that, Yvette and, Yvette and Rasha got involved in I Am the Night. I Am the Night was the, the TV miniseries based on the story of Fauna Hodel with a lot of stuff from Black Dolly Avenger kind of scraped in there. Fauna was dying of cancer. And so she handed off the project to her two daughters, Yvette and Rasha. And so subsequently, they got a podcast, Root of Evil. Okay, That's Rasha and Yvette, or Yvette and Rasha. And that entire podcast was very closely scripted. They just, they were handed a script, they read it, they were told what to say. Um, after that, they went and did uh, another podcast that tanked. It was called Facing Evil. It was a, it was a true crime podcast, supposedly. Uh, it tanked after like a year. And I don't really know what they're doing now, but yeah, sure. You know, they, they're, um, you know, Lying about George Hodel has become the family business for sure. Among some of them, not not all of them, not all of them. Um, the Philippine branch of the Hodel family they hate Steve. I've been in contact. I have been in contact with the Philippine branch of the Hodel family, and they they effing hate Steve. Um, Duncan Hodel quit talking to to Steve over Black Dolly Avengers. So I mean, there there is a lot of bad blood in the Hodel clan over Steve, Steve's comments, for sure. It is not unan unanimous at all. It is like, wow, um, behind the scenes. And I have been told this by various people who say, hey, did you know this? Did you know that? So, yeah. Um, so definitely, uh, Rasha and Yvette, Yvette and Rasha are definitely trying to cash in on whatever link they can cobble together to claim that, oh, yeah, we knew, great grandpa knew. Um, about the Black Dolly case. Okay, we are coming up on 1057. I'll, I'll do one more shorty. I discovered that Instagram will cut me off at an hour. Uh, so I, I'll need to cut this off. Yeah, yeah, Joanna, that's right. Uh, they were teasing this thing about, you know, the DNA and all of that. And and Fauna was, you know, no, there was there was never any question about that to anybody who, who you know, they, they, they were teasing that because that kind of shows you where they're coming from. In the reality, uh, the reality, no. Let's see here. Um, if I got one more quick question. Has Steve Hodel ex ever explained why George Hodel, super genius, was knocking around with the 10th grade dropout like Elizabeth Short? No. <laughs> you know, um, Steve Hodel has, is, he's like playing toy soldier. And it's like, okay, I'm going to have George Hodel, uh, 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 George Hodel kills you. <laughs> And it's just, it, it, George Hodel in the hands of Steve Hodel has become this two-dimensional individual who goes around killing people simply because Steve needs, I need my dad to kill this person. That's really all it is. And it is, it's it's sad at this point. Um, and I think that's a good place to, to wrap it up. The next one, uh, the next one of these will be the third Tuesday in January, uh, 2024. And um, so the anniversary of Elizabeth Short's murder, her disappearance and her murder uh, are coming up. Whatever you do, don't dress up like the Black Dolly. If you do anything, I, I will make the standard pitch. Make a donation in Elizabeth Short's name to some charitable organization that deals with uh, abused women and trim your roses on January 15th. Okay. And we'll see you in January. Right, Boxy? Uh -huh. Okay, folks. See you later. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Instagram is done. And I will now end the stream. Thanks again, everybody, for showing up. And we'll see you later. Merry Christmas from Boxing. <laughs>